Guys, before we get into today's video, let me tell you about its fantastic sponsor. It's Atlas VPN. It was created to make the internet more accessible and secure for everyone. Currently, it's got more than 6 million users worldwide. Good lord. And it's available on the App Store. I'm a bit of an Apple boy. So, of course, that's nice for me. Also on uh, Google Play. So, look, whatever you use, you can use Atlas. Why not? It's the best VPN deal on the market. You can enjoy the most affordable protection online for just $1.70 a month. Plus... Six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can unlock the fa your favorite content from all over the world. Look, sometimes you'll be on Netflix. And I often say, like, America's apparently you can't get Office, The Office, on Netflix. Guess where you can get that in Europe, baby. So get some Atlas VPN, jump over to Europe, and you'll enjoy that, won't you? Also, of course, it keeps your Google searches private. If you open up that incognito, yeah, other people who come to your computer aren't going to be able to see what you're up to. But your ISP certainly does. Anyone who's really good at snooping can. You know, it's not as private as you think it is, but a VPN makes it truly private. Stop ads and mouth where and you can save some money while shopping online as well yeah some places you'll go and it'll be like oh, airlines are the classic one or hotels you visit the page and it's like oh, that seems reasonable i'll definitely book that later you go back it's more expensive it's because they know you want it fire up a vpn and they won't know it's you so boom original price easy also you can protect unlimited devices with atlas vpn on a single subscription so you can get their incredible black friday deal you get atlas vpn premium for just $1.70 a month and six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee it's the best vpn offer of the year so be quick and get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below it's a limited time offer 30-day money-back guarantee there is a link below and now today's video hello everybody welcome back to another episode of decoding the unknown this one double alien abduction the vanishing yorkshire miner and the policeman plucked from time all sounds very real doesn't it or they just disappeared or they were murdered and buried in the ground what they weren't is plucked from time dun dun da danny writes it uh thank you danny i'm gonna read it and uh yeah the format of the show is i've never read this before it's a cold read we're going to decode. Let's jump in. Hovering moodily against the utterly silent landscape of the Pennine Hills in northern England, the spherical scout craft's hypertension casts an eerie, flickering glow across the peaks and valleys of the backbone of the country. Inside the alien craft, Captain Fizzybeard casually rests three of his green legs on the pulsing bank of instruments as he awaits an incoming video conference with his superior back on his home world. All of this sounds very realistic. When the video screen finally crackles into life, Captain Fizzybird is momentarily taken aback by the sight of no higher authority than Emperor Pesto himself, and neither of his faces look particularly happy. Captain Fizzybeard clears his main throat. Emperor Pesto, what a pleasant surprise. Emperor Pesto pulls several frowns. No time for small talk, Fizzybeard. We're long overdue a progress update on your mission. Can you confirm that you have finally obtained human specimens for testing? And can you confirm that these specimens include a wide range of influential figures plucked from every corner of the planet? Those alien abduction stories. It's always like, and then they probed my bottom. And it's like, do you really think the aliens travel all the way to Earth? All the way, intergalactically, interstellar, whatever, from their home world to have a look at our butts. I mean, it's just a bit weird, isn't it? It's it's like, that's not... I don't, I don't think that that's what they'd immediately be up to. And they try to anal probe me, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not taking that! Yes, Emperor Pesto. The captain ponders for a moment. Well, we did run into a spot of bother. We only managed to get two specimens this time. Only two, splutters Emperor Pesto. I take it that you have at least captured two powerful world leaders from either ends of the political spectrum. Yes, Emperor Pesto. Captain Fizzybeard pauses again. Well, not exactly. We had a bit of engine trouble, and we were only able to get a couple of specimens from a little town in West Yorkshire. One of them was a local policeman, the other was a miner. Not exactly who you were hoping for, was it? Emperor Pesto shakes two of his heads in fury. This is unacceptable, Fizzybeard! And what are all of those things in the background? Are they cows? I'm sure I can see dozens of Earth cows milling about on your flight deck. Ah, yes, Emperor. Just a slight technical problem with the abduction process. I've got my finest men clearing up the mess right now. It doesn't half stink down here. I'm not even kidding. Emperor Pesto puffs out three cheeks in frustration. You're a useless lump of lard, Fizzybeard. Your mission is aborted. You're fired, Fizzybeard. Captain Fizzybeard solemnly stands and bow bows as he prepares to leave the flight deck. Thank you for the opportunity, Emperor Pesto. You uh, this is like, <laughs> yeah, obviously it's uh, a cold open by Danny here. 
this didn't really happen could you tell uh, there was a i watched a brilliant youtube video the other day which was like uh what's what it's like reading a new science fiction book and it's just like immediately it just leaps it just starts like he awoke with his flanger not functioning properly he had overslept the morgue again and he was about to have to face down the tribulations of the flag chart and you're like say what and it is like yeah it is it just it was so it, obviously i'm just coming up with mine on the fly but this video was so on point just look up like what it's like reading a science fiction book or something it's well worth watching it's probably honestly uh, worth watching instead of this video right now so if you want you can go watch that instead it's it might well be more entertaining it might not be and I appreciate it if you stay here anyway. 1980 may be widely remembered on planet Earth as the year in which Ronald Reagan won his first presidential election, John Lennon was shot dead, and Pac-Man first began popping pills in arcades around the world. But for the people of Todd Maud in a small Yorkshire market town nestled in the Pennine Hills, it's more likely to be remembered as that pretty odd year in which at least two of the locals were allegedly abducted by aliens within the space of five months, and only one of them survived to tell the tale. <laughs> You'd be like, my butt is so sore! Why aliens are in my butt again? Todd Morden has developed something of a reputation as a UFO hotspot and a hive of mysterious activity, but one of the most shadowy mysteries ever to fall upon the town remains unsolved today. The story begins with the case of a Yorkshire miner who just vanished into thin air and has re-emerged under deeply troubling circumstances. The miner in question has the quintessentially Yorkshire name of Zygmunt Adamski. Hang on a minute, that can't be right. Ah, it turns out that Zygmunt originally hailed from Poland, but had been forced to flee his home country during the horrors of the Second World War. Adopting the affectionate new nickname of Ziggy, he married his sweetheart Lottie in 1957, and the couple happily settled down into the little village of Tingley in Leeds, West Yorkshire. I've got a great... There's, there's a town called Leeds, and I also used to live near a tiny village called Leeds. And there's the famous Leeds, which is in the north, and it's big. Wait, is this a tiny village? Oh, okay, so this small village must be near Leeds. And there's also a, a Leeds, much smaller version. And I remember my aunt was visiting. She's American. And my parents were like, okay, so we're going to go to Leeds Castle today. And uh, my aunt's like, she's packed a bag. She's got a bottle of water. She's getting ready for like a re like a three-hour car drive or something to Leeds. And then my, my parents are like, what's with all the equipment? And she's like, well, we're going to Leeds. It's a big trip, and I can't believe we're doing it in one day. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we're going to Leeds. It's it's nearby Leeds. It's about five minutes drive. <laughs> I always remember that. I enjoy that memory. You probably don't, because it's not one of your memories, but hopefully you enjoyed the story. Um, but let's get back into the story that you're all actually here for. I apologize for all the tangents. This is where Ziggy got a job as a miner in the local loft house coilery. Colliery? Coilery? Colliery? I don't even know what it is, to be honest. By 1980, the coal dust of the mines and a heavy smoking habit had begun to take its toll on 56-year-old Ziggy's lungs, and he applied for early retirement. His initial request had been rejected, but he was still awaiting news on an appeal. In the meantime, he and Lottie remained in good spirits, and they were particularly looking forward to the wedding of their goddaughter, whom Ziggy would be giving away on the big day. In fact, it was the very day before their wedding that Ziggy went missing. He had announced in the afternoon that he was just nipping down to the local grocery store to buy a bag of potatoes and errands, which should have taken around 10 minutes. He exchanged brief greetings with a neighbor on the way to the shops, and the store clerk later declared that Ziggy had been in a particularly jovial mood. It was the last time that he was ever seen alive in Tingley. Wait, <laughs> the last time I was ever seen alive in Leeds was when I last went there, but I've been seen alive elsewhere. <laughs> When Ziggy didn't return home that evening, Lottie called the police and informed them that her husband had gone missing. She seemed fearful that he had been kidnapped. It was completely out of character for Ziggy to just randomly wander off and fail to return home. Vigorous police inquiries and an appeal for information in the local newspapers drew a complete blank. It was as if Ziggy had just vanished off the face of the earth. That is until five days later, when a grim discovery was made. Oh god, his body's gonna be found. That's why it was he was never seen alive. Because he was seen dead. Oh no. Around 20 miles away from Tingley, the town in the town of Todd Morden, foreman Trevor Parker was busy working alone in Tomlin's coal yard, which belonged to his father. He briefly left the yard for a few hours in the late morning to see to his other duties, but when he returned in the afternoon, he was shocked to find that he was no longer entirely alone. Lying face up on the top of a 10-foot pile of coal was the dead body of Zygmunt Adamski. Trevor Parker was adamant that nobody had accessed the closed coal yard whilst he was away, and that the body definitely hadn't been there in the morning. 
My immediate thought here was that Ziggy may have picked up a few crates of vodka while he was buying the potatoes, embarked upon a balmy five-day bender, and ended up crawling to the top of a coal pile in a drunken slumber. That does seem much more likely than him being abducted by aliens or kidnapped, to be honest, even if he doesn't have a reputation for that. That just feels more likely than kidnapping. But when one of the attending police officers, PC Adam Alan Godfrey, closely examined the scene and the body, he uncovered a rising stack of curious points to consider. For starters, he reported that the coal heap appeared to be completely undisturbed, and there was no trace of coal dust on Ziggy's body. It looked as if nobody had even attempted to climb the coal pile, so how exactly did the body end up there? It was as if Ziggy had been dropped from the sky. Not an unreasonable assumption. Ziggy's shirt, watch, and wallet were missing from the body and were never recovered. And whilst the body was mostly dressed, it was dressed in a peculiar fashion. The trousers and coat and shoes were all fastened in a crude manner, as if Ziggy had been redressed after death by somebody who didn't entirely understand how trousers and coats and shoes should work. Or it could, rather than aliens, it could be someone who was in a rush. And also, we're not used to dressing other people. It's weird putting a coat on someone else, especially a body. I mean, I'm speculating here. I've not put a... Like, if someone was, like, lying down and not helping you, it'd be really hard to get them dressed. Although Ziggy had been missing for five days, his hair had recently been cut, and his face displayed only a day's beard growth, indicating that it had plenty of opportunity to shave during those many lost hours away from home. But even more puzzling was the ring of burn marks around Ziggy's head and neck. A mysterious slimy yellow substance and green ointment had been rubbed into these burn wounds, and although this substance was later exhaustively tested by forensic scientists, it was never identified. All of this gave the coroner, James Turnbull, a bit of a headache. He described the death of Zygmunt Adamski as the biggest mystery of his career, and after several months of deliberation, during which he couldn't pinpoint the exact cause of death, he reluctantly reached a verdict of natural causes. He ruled that Ziggy had most likely died from heart failure, but he didn't seem entirely convinced. PC Allen Godfrey would remain forever haunted by the face of Zygmunt Adamski. He revealed that those eyes sent a shudder down my spine. They were wide open. He had a look of someone who had seen something, or someone that had scared him to death. When asked by the press if he believed the hushed local whispers that Ziggy might have been abducted by aliens, he replied, I am open-minded. I can't rule it out. <laughs> Don't, if you're the police, you should definitely not be like, oh, it's probably aliens. Because the reality is, he was probably murdered or kidnapped, and you're being like, oh, no, it's definitely aliens. And that means there's a murderer or a kidnapper just out there on the loose because you were way too open-minded. You shouldn't be that open-minded. Like, there's a limit to how open-minded you should be. Close your mind. You pull the trigger. There were other, less outlandish theories, of course. A lot he always seemed convinced that her husband had been kidnapped and held hostage for long days, be for days before he was murdered and dumped onto the coal pile. Others pointed the finger squarely at the KGB, <laughs> who had a bit of a habit of hunting down enemies of the state in foreign countries and quietly eliminating them. Uh, why was he an enemy of the... He's not an enemy of the state. He was just a dude who fled Poland. Uh, because the Second World War was horrible. I don't know if he was Jewish or whatever. Adamski. It sounds more Polish than Jewish. I don't know. Is that Jewish? It's, I don't. Look, I don't know. Zygmunt. Are you familiar what a hate crime is, Jake? No. It doesn't matter. Look, for whatever reason, he fled. It wasn't because he was a spy and he was being hunted down by, like, the KGB. He was just a regular dude, as far as we know. He's a minor. I'm not, I'm good. He's not a spy. But there's no evidence that Polish-born Ziggy ever pissed off the Soviet Union, and it's not clear why the KGB, or indeed anyone else for that matter, would go to the trouble of kidnapping a well-liked coal miner with declining health for five days. Perhaps the cause of death did indeed come from the skies, but from the mysterious and largely unfathomable ball lightning, a spherical form of lightning which tends to hover over the ground like a giant menacing golf ball. This might at least explain those strange burns and Ziggy's possible heart failure, but it doesn't really answer the question of why it was covered in an unidentified ointment, or how it was dropped on top of a 10-foot-high pile of coal, or how it was shaved. I suppose he could have just been away from home for a few days. I don't know. It sounds insane. Like, it seems insane to me, the idea that people could just run off for a few days, but it definitely happens. People are like, yeah, no, I just, I just it all became too much, as so I just ran away from my family for a few days. And I'd be like, my wife would be pissed <laughs> like holy shit. if i just went on like a five-day trip without telling her and didn't phone her she'd be absolutely livid and i would not blame her if she did the same thing i'd be absolutely mad <laughs> so that just leaves us with alien abduction it's clear that ziggy was abducted shortly after picking up those potatoes from the shops and he was probed for five days 
on an alien spacecraft. <laughs> Probed in the butthole. After accidentally setting his head on fire, the aliens briefly attempted to heal his wounds with magic cosmic goo, but when Ziggy's frail heart gave out from the stress, the aliens clumsily, clumsily redressed him as best they could manage and beamed his corpse down to the top of a pile of coal in Todd Morden before zipping back to the Benines to await further instructions. They may or may not have kept the bag of potatoes. However, within the space of just five months, the aliens would be back in Todd Morden, and this time they had their bulbous eyes targeted on another victim. Quite incredibly, that second victim would be none other than P.C. Allen Godfrey, the very same British Bobby who had attended the death scene of at Tomlin's Coal Yard. In the early hours of one cold November morning in the town of Todd Morden, P.C. Allen Godfrey was on high alert during an intense midnight mission. There's a good reason why all the best high-octane TV cop shows are set in places like New York or Miami or the mean streets of San Francisco. If P.C. Allen Godfrey's exploits had been adapted into an episode of Todd Maud and Tribulations, the viewers would have been on the edge of their seats as they watched the constable driving around the town in search of a herd of runaway cows who were annoying local residents with their manic mooing. I feel like there are British TV shows like this. Like there's really boring TV shows, the sort of things that I imagine my parents would like. And they have quite a good taste in television sometimes, but they also like some uh, uh, drivel. And there was this one show, like there's shows like this where it's like, there'll be a detective and he'll be in a small town and he investigates just boring <laughs> shit that boring people are up to. And that's, that's that. That's that, that's the, that's the show, right? Boring, isn't it? 33-year-old Godfrey, a married father of two, hadn't had much luck through the night in tracking down the rogue cows. In fact, he was starting to think that the whole thing was a wind-up, and he nipped back to the station after failing to pick up the slightest scent of a single displaced cow. But just as he was getting ready to clock off at around 5am, he was spurred into action again when yet another call came in from a concerned residence. This unnamed elderly woman had phoned to complain that around five or six cows were mooching around in her front garden and trampling all over her chrysanthemums. Yet during the call, the resident reported a blinding light from outside which illuminated the whole house when she peered out of the window again the cows had disappeared godfrey wasn't too spooked by this he figured the light was probably just the full beam of a passing car which had frightened away the fugitive cattle godfrey sounds like a logical and sensible man and look what happened to him because i bet you heard that sentence and were like oh that could be the aliens and godfrey's like it's a car isn't it scaring the cows away godfrey i like you it's aliens it has to be but he got back in his police car and had one last scout around town for suspicious cow activity. Along the way, he passed a fellow police officer who politely declined Godfrey's offer of a lift back to the station. Godfrey later pondered on how he wished that officer had got into the car with him because he would then have a reliable witness to the inconceivable event that was about to unfold. Oh my, is Godfrey, reliable Godfrey, car headlight, no alien abduction Godfrey, is he about to have his ass probed? Less than a mile away from Tomlin's coal yard, PC Allen Godfrey came across an unusual vehicle Vehicle blocking the main road, which caused him to slam on the brakes. Twenty yards away, a diamond-shaped object was hovering in the air around five feet from the ground. Godfrey estimated that it was around 14 feet tall, 20 feet wide. He claimed that a fluorescent light was emanating from a large dome on top of the slowly rotating vessel, and the trees at the side of the road were shaking violently, even though he couldn't detect the faintest of vibrations. Godfrey figured that he might need backup to help deal with this one. He attempted to contact the police station via his personal UHF radio and the police car's usually more reliable VHF radio, but he was met with complete silence. Being a quick-thinking Bobby, Godfrey decided that the best course of action was to get out onto the road, whip out his notepad, and draw a pretty picture of the unidentified craft. That sounds a bit silly, but back in the pre-smartphone era, drawing quick sketches on a pad was a common practice for officers who needed to quickly convey the exact positions of vehicles involved in traffic accidents. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. If you don't have a camera, <laughs> like drawing little sketches is probably the best thing that you could do. However, Godfrey had barely completed his miniature work of art before he was temporarily blinded by a bright flash and suddenly found himself sitting back in his car, but around 30 yards from where he had originally parked. Sounds like Godfrey is having little blackouts. I'm always like, whenever something like happens like this, it's like you don't, you're not seeing an alien spacecraft, you're not seeing a ghost, your brain is just having a little bit of a <laughs> little brain fart, like a <laughs> something went wrong for a second, and that's what you saw. Like if I saw a ghost right now, I'd be like, man. <laughs> I hope I'm not having a stroke. <laughs> it's just a little thing going like, pfft, it's just gone wrong for a second. And it sounds like this guy is going wrong for a few more seconds and he should probably have an MRI. An MRI. ASAP. The craft had vanished, and Godfrey later deduced that he couldn't account for 25 minutes of missing time between the flash and the 30-yard hop. Not only that, but one of his boots was split wide open, and there was a small, itchy burn mark on his foot. No sign of magic goo, though. Maybe the aliens couldn't be asked to heal this one, as he wasn't too badly hurt. It was thoughtful of them to place him back in his vehicle, though, instead of just dumping him in a coal yard. 
When Godfrey made his way back to the spot of the sighting, he felt a strange electrical tickle in the air and noticed that leaves and twigs had formed a spiral pattern on the road which was completely dry, despite the fact that it had been raining heavily. But at least this episode of Todd Maud and Tribulations would have concluded with a happy ending. Good old Godfrey found those runaway cows. Even that was a bit weird, though he hadn't spotted a single cow all night anywhere in the town, and then he suddenly came across a massive herd of them in the local car park. The cows had never previously chosen to hang out in the car park, and it's not clear how they even got in there as the gates had been locked all night and there were no signs of hoof prints around the muddy surrounding areas. Maybe the aliens had been more interested in cow probing all along, and the Yorkshire miner and Bobby just got in the way. The cows oh, were keeping Stumper now, though. Yeah, this is one of those. Like, I, I often wonder with this, right? And I often and find myself wondering on this show like what is my what 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 is my level of proof or level of evidence required because i'm pretty much moving away i think i i don't think i'm moving away from i'm pretty much of the opinion that if it's not if, like eyewitnesses and people telling stories is not evidence like someone coming forward and saying this happened to them is not evidence for the same reason that i don't believe uh like someone's like i died and i went to the afterlife and i'm like yeah but that's not real you might think you went there but you didn't and i'm just like unless there's like proper photos or video of people like simon there's photos and videos of ufos yeah but it's always shit, isn't it it's never like definitively like that is a fucking alien spacecraft and that is a genuine video of it and there's very little doubt it's always like super grainy or it's a flashing light something like this and it's just like yeah but it's just not convincing is it and some people are convinced and i think they just have way too low a barrier to entry of convincingness those words are not real or making any sense whatsoever but i think you might get my meaning right jeffrey was informed the next working day that three other police officers searching for stolen motorbikes in the nearby town of halifax had witnessed a strange steel blue light in the sky on the same night although he later discovered that they filed their report several days earlier. But if Godfrey was expecting support from the force over his balmy notions, he was going to be disappointed. After the story was leaked to the local press, he became a figure of fun within the police station and was given the new derisory nickname of Captain Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no one believes you! Things took a slightly more sinister turn when Jeffrey claims that he was hauled into the inspector's office for a meeting with a gentleman who would only identify himself as the man from the ministry. Jeffrey claimed that this bloke, whom he described as an arrogant bastard, ordered Jeffrey under the Official Secrets Act not to speak to the media again about his close encounter. Um, I don't believe you, Jeffrey. I just don't believe you. I don't think that's how people from, like, spies or whatever or the MOD work. I think that your story is so absurd and so silly that they're not going to pay you a meeting because that lends some credibility to it they'll just be like let the person say like even if all of this was real and the ministry of defense were communicating with aliens and he had actually seen it he'd just be like nah just let him just let him, let him go because no one's going to believe him and if we show up and put a meeting on the books that's going to add some credence to it which we definitely don't want to do I just watched an episode of stargate about this where some guy finds out about their whole like secret stargate program and makes a tv show about it and they're like wait why didn't we like tell him to that like swear him to silence and stuff and they're just like because no one will believe him anyway and no one does oh jamie it's magnificent who's jamie the man from the ministry was fumbling about with a bulky file and although jeffrey wasn't allowed to view it he reckons that he managed to catch glimpses of both his own sketch of the craft and zygmunt adamski's death report indicating that higher authorities are clearly linked to the two abductions later on jeffrey claims that his home telephone was tapped and that he was constantly followed around by the same man from the ministry sounds like jeffrey needs to get his head checked one time i'll put a firefly on my butthole Jeffrey finally blew his top when the man popped up in his local pub just as Jeffrey was trying to sink a welcome pint. The police constable told the man from the ministry, in an embellished Yorkshire accent, to take a long walk on a short pier. He never saw the man from the ministry again. Yeah, that's also something like MOD officials, spies, essentially, like MI5 or whatever, definitely easily intimidated by a random Yorkshire policeman. You know, it's not so out of this world that men from the ministry might also sometimes fancy a welcome pint in a pub without being told by angry locals to go jump in the sea. Sick to the back teeth of the stalking and the ridicule, PC Alan Godfrey was persuaded by a solicitor friend to undergo three sessions of hypnotic regression in a bid to pluck out those 25 minutes of missing time from his memory. That's not a real thing, is it? You can't use hypnosis to recover lost memories that you genuinely have lost 
right? I think I made a video about that. As he fell into a hypnotic trance and was taken back to the road on that dark November night, Godfrey recalled moving towards the strange alien craft and getting hit by a beam of light which rendered him unconscious. When he awoke, he found himself strapped to a table in a room occupied by small childlike creatures with bulbous heads working alongside a bearded biblical figure in robes who introduced himself as Joseph and telepathically communicated to Godfrey that he would be fine. Oh, and there was a dog in the corner of the examining room too, which may or may not have been an Alsatian. Okie dokie. Sounds like you're getting, you're making up fake memories, not even if you're not doing it intentionally. Sunday Mirror journalist John Sherrod watched video recordings of the sessions and reported on some of the bonkers stuff that the hypnotized Jeffrey was coming out with. To quote, they're horrible, like five-year-old lads. There are eight of them. He's feeling at my clothes. They have heads like a lamp. They keep touching me. Joseph has told me not to be frightened. They're robots. They're not human. They are Joseph's robots. There's a bloody dog. It's horrible. It's the size of an Alsatian. It sounds like he's just, it sounds like he's tripping balls, to be honest. The final hypnotic regression session was brought to a premature close over concerns that Godfrey was becoming increasingly traumatized by the missing memories. It's worth pointing out that Godfrey himself isn't entirely convinced that the hypnosis sessions actually ever meant anything. He always made it clear that he never once claimed outside of hypnotic regression to have been abducted by aliens. He had only reported on things he believed he had seen with his own eyes on that night. He played down the hypnosis session in later years, speculating that he may have just been lost in a vivid dream, or he may have been linked to the book that he was reading at the time, an account of the first high-profile alleged alien abduction of Betty and Barney Hill in New Hampshire in 1961. Still, I reckon the Alsatian could have been the dude in charge, or Godfrey could have just wrongly identified another small cow eagerly awaiting its turn on the examination table. Yeah, I just, I just don't believe any of this. I'm sorry, I just there's not there's no evidence, there's no real evidence. There's just a dude who thinks he saw something, had a blackout. You know, the same thing happened to me last week. I was over there. And that's kind of that, to be honest. I'm not convinced. PC Allen Godfrey wasn't the only one who claimed to have spotted strange sights over West Yorkshire. In 2021, Todd Borden local Vicky Dinsdale broke a 50 broke a 40-year silence when she talked to the national press about something she'd seen during her childhood in the town in 1981. A young Vicky had been walking the dog with her grandfather when they both spotted a glittering diamond-shaped object hovering in the sky and constantly changing color. Vicky's grandfather was a retired army sergeant, so he t and he told Vicky to keep what they'd seen to themselves, as he didn't want to experience the same kind of ridicule that had been heaped upon PC Godfrey just a year earlier. I'm sorry, this is a 40-year memory from when you were a kid. I'm just like, this is not reliable in any way. In 1987, a retired police officer by the name of Philip Spencer took a very crap, blurry photograph what a surprise of what it they're all crap and they're all blurry of what he believed to be an alien creature running around ilkley moor in west yorkshire he saw a dome-shaped craft rising away into the skies and felt that two hours of time had been stolen from him spencer also underwent hypnotic regression and recalled similar tales of finding himself on an examining table in an alien spacecraft and the problem is like once someone said that that's what people have in their minds and it's what they expect and hypnosis is one of those things where you're super um impressionable and so you're bound to experience things that you are expecting to experience. Then there was the curious case of Travis Walton, which took place much earlier in 1975. Admittedly, this one wasn't remotely local to West Yorkshire. Trevor Walton was an American logger who had just finished up a shift at the Apache Sitgreaves National Forests near Snowflake, Arizona. But his story bears remarkable similarities to the cases of both PC Allen Godfrey and Sigmund Adamski. Walton and his co-workers had spotted a saucer-shaped object in the evening sky, but Walton was the only one brave enough to move in for a closer look. He soon found himself bathed in light before waking up on, you guessed it, an alien examining table. He claims that he ended up getting involved in a bout of fisticuffs with three short bald aliens before he blacked out found himself back on the highway as the flying saucer flew off into the distance. But on this occasion, it was more than 20 minutes or a couple of hours. Travis Walton had been officially missing for five days. It sounds that maybe he just went on a bit of a bender. Maybe it was just like, oh, life's a bit tough. I'm just going to go on a five-day bender and then blame it on aliens. We should do that sometime. <laughs> Travis, you've done this before! He hasn't, but it's like, you can imagine he did. <laughs> of course, it's easy to dismiss all these people as attention-seeking fantasists, and maybe some of them were. Yes. Indeed. Oh, well, not poor Ziggy, obviously. He never asked to be found dead on top of a coal pile and had little to do with the subsequent world theories. He probably, if he was alive, he'd be like, oh, just doing a bit of a bender, mate, to be honest. It just went on a bit, it just got a bit crazy. How did you get on top of the coal pile? I climbed up there. But we didn't find any fur. I guess they blew away. Oh, come on. 
Poor Ziggy. He's just like, I just got drunk and died on the top of a coal pile. Everyone else, you had your butt probed by aliens, didn't you, Zigster? Come on. But it's a little odd that both Alan Godfrey and Philip Spencer had worked in the police force. They weren't your usual dribbling nutters that you'd avoid down the pub. Godfrey, in particular, was described as a plain speaking and no nonsense Yorkshireman who, in his own words, had no time for daft buggers. He just didn't seem like the type to make shit up. Yeah, I don't think he I don't think he necessarily made shit up. I just think he had a p in his brain. And the manner in which he conducted himself and conveyed his strange tale has attracted its fair share of supporters over the years. Philip Mantle, an author, broadcaster, and international UFO researcher feels that Godfrey's story is particularly compelling. He notes, Godfrey's account has been scrutinized from day one and his recollection of it has never changed. Meanwhile, retired police detective Gary Hesseltine claims that he studied Godfrey's case over the course of 18 months and got to know the man himself very well. He says, I'm one of the very few people who've seen every minute of his hypnotic regression videos. Based on all I know of this case, I believe his account is genuine. This leads us into another interesting question. Why would anyone in Godfrey's position feel inclined to make up such a wacky tale? It's not like UFO spotters who go public end up getting swamped in fame and recognition and respect. If I had the chance of getting widely ridiculed as a wide-eyed crackpot and not getting widely ridiculed as a wide-eyed crackpot, I'm going to choose that latter option all day long. Yeah, but Danny, not everyone is like this. Some people just like attention for the sake of attention. It doesn't have to be positive or negative. I don't think Jeff Godfrey I was going to call him Jeffrey for a sec. Godfrey is one of these people. I think he's not. I think his brain just went a bit for a second. It has to be said that the incidents with the hovering diamond craft didn't really have much of a positive impact on Godfrey's life. Quite the opposite, in fact. Godfrey claimed that he was forced into taking a transfer to another police station before he was hounded out of the force altogether and pushed into early retirement. He developed a taste for a bottle of whiskey a day. His marriage broke up and he ended up living in a friend's attic bedroom without a pot to piss in. That's sad. Jeez. He seemed to blame it all on the events of the night of the farcical cow hunt. He said, It wrecked me. It completely changed me. I wish I'd never seen the UFO. However, Godfrey's life picked up again in the mid-90s. He remarried, he got a grip on his life, and after a long period of rarely discussing the events of that night, he appeared to almost embrace his celebrity status. He started appearing on TV chat shows, giving public talks to help raise funds for charity, and today he drives around Todd Morden with a personalized UFO license plate. All right, I mean, you see, capitalizing on it a little bit, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of money to be made there, isn't there? He self-published a book into it in 2017 called Who or What Were They? Then it was announced in 2021 that there were tentative plans to turn his story into a movie produced by Michael Grace, best known for co-writing the classic 1982 horror Poltergeist. Maybe Todd Maud and Tribulations wasn't such a bad pitch after all. It had better include the comedy cows. Now in his mid-70s, Alan Godfrey remains convinced of what he saw. He says, This was a nuts and bolts craft, not a trick of the mind. If I had thrown a brick at it, it would have gone bang. I would swear on the Bible it was from somewhere else. Well, let's put the Bible down for a second. Let's see if we can come up with a more plausible alternative theory, shall we? Yes, let's do that. Okay, rewinding back to the tragic case of Zygmunt Adamski, there's one specific detail that doesn't quite add up for me. Now, it's reported that the 10-foot-high coal pile showed no signs of disturbance, leading to speculation that Ziggy must have been dropped onto the pile from above. But unless the foreman, Trevor Parker, was incredibly tall, he must surely have scrambled to the top of the coal pile himself to confirm that there was a dead body up there. Oh, right, of course, and he could have, like, totally just trampled over um old zigster's footprints right and if his own scramble to the top hadn't created much of a disturbance perhaps it's out not out of the question that an earlier scramble to the top had gone equally unnoticed right sure we'll never solve the mystery of the green alien slime substance that was never identified but magic cosmic goo aside i think it's safe to say that zygmunt adamski was kidnapped by human hands and he was either murdered or he died during quite barbaric torture it's true that the kidnapper was considerate enough to give ziggy an opportunity to shave a day before his death and this is why it can't just have been a random bungled mugging that proved to be fatal this was a long-term situation that was still playing out after four days but it's clear that something deeply unpleasant was going on, bearing in mind that Ziggy was burned and completely undressed at some point. But who would do such a thing? It's interesting that when his wife, Lottie, feared that her husband wasn't coming home tonight, she immediately suspected that he'd been kidnapped. If one of my family members suddenly went missing, I'd feel concerned they may have been run over or fallen down a well or something. I wouldn't immediately suspect that they'd been kidnapped and were being held hostage in a remote barn. His wife did it. 
No, I'd be like, I think, of course, it would enter my mind a bit. Like, oh my god, someone been kidnapped. I don't know. Yeah, I think I could think someone's been kidnapped, like for like blackmail or money or whatever. And then it'd be like, okay, that sucks. Um, but I also think it's just totally possible that they're lost or they're hurt or I mean, phone the police, phone the hospitals or whatever. Because uh, I, I think it's much more likely that they're probably in hospital and they haven't had a chance to talk to me yet. Or they got arrested or something for something. <laughs> I don't know what my family would get arrested for. <laughs> but, you know, that sort of stuff is more likely than kidnap. But when two UFO investigators recently looked into the case, they discovered why Lottie may have jumped to that conclusion. Ziggy and Lottie had recently accepted a female family member into their home who had taken out a restraining order on her husband and had been offered a safe space to live within the Adamski household. But could it be that this troubled husband was the one with an axe to grind over the Adamskis interfering with his marital affairs and giving shelter to his estranged wife? Yes, absolutely, certainly. That is the number one guy that you should immediately be looking into. Could he have lost the plot over a five-day act of brutal vengeance against Ziggy? It's remarkable that this was never properly investigated at the time, as everyone preferred to focus instead on the alien abduction angle. And as I said earlier, when you start focusing on that, which is most likely not going to be a real thing, we'd say, we'd say that with almost absolute certainty, then it causes you to ignore things that are much more likely, like this, which is obviously far more likely that he did it. Of course it is. I... I Come on. We may never know why the kidnapper or murderer decided to dump the hastily redressed corpse onto the top of the coal pile, but we can speculate that they were just completely unhinged. Whatever the truth, it's doubtful that Ziggy ever made it to the stars. Incidentally, the good news for Ziggy is that his appeal for early retirement from the Lofthouse Coilery ultimately proved to be successful. Unfortunately, the letter arrived in the post the day after the discovery at Tomlin's Coal Yard. Oh no, it's like in the movies where it's like, he's a day before, as a detective and he's a day before retirement. And then he's going on some mission. Is that Lethal Weapon? Is that that movie where that happens? I'm sure it's, it's a trope. It's probably happened in many movies. Okay, moving forward to the case of Alan Godfrey. I'm not convinced that missing time is such an unusual phenomenon. I once lost an entire night around 2003. Admittedly, I was blind drunk, but it was still a deeply troubling situation with an alarming outcome. I can remember drinking at my home one evening with a half plan to call into town later to meet up with a few friends down the pub, but I was knocked for six by the strength of the stuff I was drinking. I woke up the next morning covered in cuts and scratches with no memory of what had happened the night before. I reckon I lost at least least five hours of time. Yeah, mate. <laughs> I've not woken up with injuries. I, I mean, I did once crack my head open when I was drunk, but I wasn't that drunk. I was just like drunk and I slipped over. <laughs> I just wagged my head on the ground. <laughs> but of course, I've like lost time where you're just like super drunk. But this guy wasn't super drunk. He's just, a, he was a policeman on doing his rounds and shit. I called up my friends to ask if anyone had bumped into me, but nobody had seen me all night. Oh my God, Danny, what did you get up to? I mean, I'm, I've never had a drunken adventure that good. Later that week, I flicked through the local free newspaper and came across the startling headline, Man th Falls Through Pub Window. Apparently, some drunken idiot had attempted to walk into the pub, but instead of using the door, he'd elected to just walk through the large front window. After smashing the window to bits, he got up and wandered off. <laughs> it was only when I popped into the very same pub the following week that the disgruntled landlord huffily revealed that the drunken idiot had been me. That was the most expensive pint of lager I've ever bought in my life. Oh my god, Danny, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love it. I'm pretty sure that PC Alan Godfrey hadn't been drinking alcohol when he was driving around in his little panda car that night in 1980, but it was five o'clock in the morning and the time, and he could have been pretty tired. Psychologists have speculated that Godfrey could have just been sleep deprived and prone to a vivid hallucinatory experience. Dr. David Clark from the Sheffield Hallam University has gone one step further and suggested that Godfrey experiences being hit by a blast of white light sounds exactly like somebody having an epileptic fit. As for those pretty wild hypnosis sessions, Christopher French, Emeritus Professor of Psychology at the University of London, is very skeptical of hypnotic regression in general. Yes, exactly, me too. Um, also, the epileptic fit thin, that's kind of what I mean when I like, pfft, his brain had a pfft, like, an epileptic fit is that, isn't it? It's where your brain's gone a little bit funny for a short time. Uh, that professor dude reckons, The thing with hypnotic regression is that it is one of the best known ways of generating false memories. If you go for hypnotic regression, expecting to recover memories of alien abduction, there's a very good chance that's what you're going to get. Yes, I said it earlier. And what about the mysterious man from the ministry? It's possible that Godfrey was getting just a little bit paranoid at the time, and the man from the ministry was nothing more than a guy from West Yorkshire police who was keeping tabs on Godfrey and trying to get him to keep his mouth shut in order to avoid any 
avert future public embarrassment. I still think he only wanted a pint in that bar before Godfrey started giving him directions to the pier. <laughs> Godfrey's like a gangster shit. You take a long walk on that short pier, son. <laughs> oh shit, Godfrey! But here's a fascinating thought which was first proposed quite recently by UFO researcher Russ Callahan. It's very possible that Alan Godfrey really did see something that resembled a flying saucer on that night, except it wasn't a flying saucer, it was a fut Futuro house. Futuro houses, or pods, were incredibly funky plastic buildings which were meant to be all the rage in the 1970s. They were originally designed by Finnish architect Matty Sarone, who envisioned them as futuristic-looking ski chalets which could be easily constructed and transported to different sites. But it ends up developing into more of a universally transportable home or office which could be used in any environment or for any event. Built from brightly colored fiberglass reinforced polyester plastic with an airplane hatch entrance and held off by sturdy legs, these super Cool. The super cool thing about the Futuro homes is that the pods looked almost exactly like the kind of flying saucers they were not seen in old movies. I'd love to have one in my back garden today. I'd probably convert it into a bar. Like a legend, Danny. But perhaps surprisingly, the Futuro houses never really took off, possibly because some people thought that they looked a bit weird and scary. They really did look as if they'd just landed from outer space. Only about a hundred were ever built, and only one ever made it to the UK. And you'll never guess exactly where it landed. Yes, it landed in the little market town of Todd Morden in West Yorkshire. Holy shit, I still think it's epilepsy or his brain having a fart, but. It is not bad. It was bought by a company called Waterside Plastics, who used it as a quirky office space for the best part of a decade, but it also got moved around the town quite a bit for occasional celebratory events that required a pop-up ticket office. Waterside Plastics folded in 1979, but the Futuro House remained in town for several more years and was probably a lot more mobile than it had been for the previous decade. It was often moved around on a truck for different events and purposes within the town before it mysteriously disappeared at some point during the mid-1980s. But it was certainly still hovering around town in November 1980. I reckon that a particularly tired or stressed or overworked officer may well have reached the end of a long shift at 5 a.m. and in the blanket of darkness, he mistook the movement of the UK's only Futuro house for an alien spacecraft. This just leaves the most intriguing mystery of all, those vanishing space cows. Is that really, uh, Mystery is that really a big mystery? They're cows, they wander around, it happens. It does seem remarkably odd that Godfrey was initially unable to catch sight of a single runaway cow, reported to be running amok in the town by several residents, but then after his close encounter, he suddenly found them all at once in a locked car park. How did they get there and where had they been? I don't think this is a particularly big mystery. I think, okay, they got there somehow, they pushed the gate shut and got locked in. Also, cows go around in herds, right? So unless you happen to be where the herd is, it's not like they're all dispersed throughout the town. Perhaps by accident or design, they really had been plucked from their grazing pastures of Todd Morder by Captain Fizzybeard and his crew and ended up wandering around the scout ship hypertension in mild indignation. But could it be that the same fatigued or ill police officer, having undergone a mind-melting experience, didn't produce the most reliable reports at the end of that fateful shift? Having embraced his celebrity status in more recent years and with a blockbuster movie on the cards, he's not very likely to look back at those events with a more logical and rational manner. I'd bet my very last bag of potatoes on it. Indeed, thank you, Danny, for writing this. Thank you for watching or listening. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, make sure you leave us a review. That would be awesome. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.